Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to furthering both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I am a dental surgeon and also the course director for a series of online lectures provided as a service to the profession of dentistry to deliver a literature and knowledge-based approach to dental implant education for practitioners interested in learning more about how to implement the discipline of oral implantology into their clinical practice. This online course should be merged with a suitable clinical course and long-term mentorship study club program so that the learner can maximize their benefit from the didactic online program. The production of this series of lectures was partially funded by an educational grant from the International Dental Implant Academy. Lecture 4, the pre-surgical assessment. So what is a, the pre-surgical assessment all about? We'll go back to the medical history and we're going to say review, review, review. You can never review the patient's medical history often enough prior to operating on them. In the previous uh, lectures, we highlighted a few of the things in the medical history that you want to see. It's not just noting what, what the factors or sorry, what the pertinent uh, 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 findings that need to be uh, identified are. What needs to be addressed is that there's some sort of a plan to manage these conditions. The main question we ask at this level is, can the surgical be prescription be filled and at what level of confidence? A thorough history and physical is suggested prior to operating on any patient, specifically if one is in doubt about the reported stability of the patient's condition. You can do this yourself or refer the patient to their primary care physician. They always say in medicine, when in doubt, rule it out. In terms of surgical history, I'm much more confident when I ask a patient, have you had surgery before, and they report to me that they have already had surgery and uh, they had uh, wisdom teeth removed or they had a gallbladder removed or they had a hysterectomy and they, they let me know that there were no post-operative complications or bleeding problems or anything like that. Uh, what scares me the most is when the patient comes in and I say, tell me about your surgical history and they say, I've never had any surgery, surgery before. This is where the weird and wonderful and the rare bleeding disorders like protein C and S deficiency, factor V Leiden deficiency, and some of the more rare forms of hemophilia can present themselves. So as mentioned, when in doubt, rule it out. Five things that will cause major issues for you in any surgical procedure or in dentistry in general. Uh, number one, coronary artery disease. Number two, uncontrolled asthma or any other type of airway emergency. Number three, allergy. Number four, exsanguination or bleeding. And number five, uncontrolled diabetes. We talk about these in more detail in lecture 20 when we talk about management of medical emergencies in the dental office. Reviewing the chief complaint, why? The history of the chief complaint and the expectations of the patient are basically going to guide what it is that you're doing. You also want to make sure that you have some sort of a plan for pre-existing dental disease as we know that caries and periodontal diseases are not good. We know that some of the pathogens that are involved in periodontal disease are the same pathogens that are involved in the development of peri-implant mucositis and peri-implantitis. Uh, peri the patient's motivation and oral hygiene ability and finally financial constraints. As mentioned previously, surprises in implant dentistry are never a good thing, and we will talk about this more in Lecture 5 in terms of consent law. But in terms of reviewing the chief complaint, you need to determine if the patient's coming to see you for an uh, implant solution that's going to lead to a removable prosthesis, and if so, is that going to be a remo removable prosthesis with locator attachments or something that's going to have a bar? Is the patient coming to see you for a fixed prosthetic? And if this is, is going to be a fixed prosthetic, is this going to be one of the metal hybrid uh, denture type fixed prosthetics? Or are they actually seeking something which is an all porcelain solution? There's obvious cost uh, differences that exist between all of these options, but these are the things that need to be reviewed and discussed when one is uh, taking a look at the patient's chief complaint and the treatment plan and ensuring that patients have, have a visual of what they're going to be getting as an end product. Setting unreasonable treatment goals 
can lead to failure to achieve the desired outcomes and may result in dissatisfied patients. And dissatisfied patients is never a good thing. This is particularly true when patients have unrealistic functional or aesthetic expectations. We have come a long way in implant dentistry, but don't be fooled. Implants improve quality of life for patients who suffer from partial or complete edentulism. They are not an exact replacement for teeth and natural soft and hard tissues. Sometimes there may be a benefit to practicing a procedure before doing it. In this sense, cadaver dissection is an excellent means by which to uh, learn about different types of procedures. One can also conduct things like model surgery or surgery on a stereolithography model uh, of the patient or uh, lastly we talk about cadaver dissection. Uh, there is a clinician who is based out of uh, South Carolina, Dr. John Russo. Actually, sorry, I think he's based out of Florida, but he's affiliated with the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, if one has not taken his course, uh, I'm not paid to say this, I took his course myself. I think he's a great guy. Uh, if, uh, his, you can look up his course. It's russoseminars.com. Uh, he runs an excellent course. It's a three-day course out of either South Carolina or Las Vegas, and one can learn a lot uh, during this course from uh, both himself and the other instructors that are on it. Uh, from the other students who participate and there is a uh, uh, cadaver uh, dissection which is available uh, to participants. Anatomy review. Uh, it's always good to uh, review the anatomy and the form of these edentulous ridges. Uh, take a look at, again at the inter-arch relationships that exist. Number three, the position relative to remaining teeth. Is there enough space for the implant and the prosthesis? Number four, the volume and quantity of bone, but also the adjacent type of soft tissue attached versus not attached and keratinized versus non-keratinized, as this may affect the probability of successful integration and long-term maintenance of the implants. And in terms of long-term maintenance, we basically mean that keratinized tissue, keratinized attached tissue, has a, a, a bit more, uh, is a bit more robust in terms of uh, preventing things like peri-implantitis. Number five, the effect that bone loss has on anterior-posterior dynamics and the reasonableness of the uh, fixed prosthetics. Uh, we're referring to levers here. Uh, number six, vital structures. And number seven, surgical spaces. Be scared. Be scared, be scared. There was a study on limb loss in individuals who used power tools, and they, they found that there was a correlation between those who became complacent about the risks of injury using these power tools as compared to new users who admitted that they exercised caution. The take home point here is always be scared of what you're about to be using. Uh, don't think that bad things cannot happen. I remember the first time in dental school when I had to prepare a class to restoration in a patient uh, that you know my instructor said to me okay take the drill and go do this and if, if you can take yourself back to that that moment didn't you think that was kind of a bit, uh, a bit weird? Uh, it was the same thing also when I had to give local anesthetic to uh, a patient. I remember my instructor, Dr. Dan Haas, who uh, was the head of dental anesthesia at the time, now he's the dean, uh, uh, basically say to us, uh, okay, go ahead and do this. Well, I mean, I was holding a 25-gauge needle, with, which was, I think, two and a half inches long. And uh, from my own perspective, uh, in terms of giving injections, or sorry, taking injections as a patient, I was very accustomed to going to the, my physician to get my, my TB uh, test or to get uh, uh, a tetanus shot done. And normally they use these really small syringes uh, with these uh, innocent looking uh, uh, half, one, one inch to half inch uh, 30 gauge needles. Uh, take a look at this photograph over here. This uh, young lady, you think she's scared getting this thing done? Well, w when we first start doing these procedures, we are scared to do it. So you have to remember, be scared, be scared, be scared. Never become complacent. When you become complacent, that's when bad things happen. We're going to take a look at the ASA classification system. This is the American Society of Anesthesiology Physical Status Classification System. So you have ASA 1, which is a normal healthy patient, ASA 2, which is a patient with mild systemic disease, ASA 3, a patient with severe systemic disease that limits activity but it is not incapacitating, ASA 4, a patient with incapacitating systemic disease that is a constant threat to life, ASA 5, a moribund patient not expected to survive 24 hours with or without operation, ASA 6, a declared brain dead patient uh, whose organs are being removed for donor purposes, and ASA E, basically you add an E for emergency operations of any variety, E precedes the number indicating the patient's physical status. 
So more or less the take home point from these ASA classifications is that one and two are gonna be straightforward for you. Three and four may warrant consultation with the patient's primary care physician and other workup in the form of blood work like uh, complete blood count, electrolytes, liver function tests, uh, asking about their hemoglobin A1C, etc. cetera, uh, electrocardiogram to find out if this patient's gonna be able to withstand surgical stress or even a chest x-ray. So in terms of anesthesia, there's different uh, modalities that are available to you. Uh, the majority of implants that I place in my own clinical practice are just under simple local anesthesia. So uh, xylocaine, articaine, uh, marcaine for post-op analgesia. However, there are other, other things available to you like mild sedation in the form of oral sedation or nitrous, uh, moderate sedation in the form of oral sedation or IV sedation, uh, or deep sedation for patients who require it. So in terms of local anesthesia, uh, what type of techniques you're gonna, are you going to use? Well, more or less, you're going to use the same techniques that you use routinely in dental practice for other aspects of oral surgery. So things like the periosteal infiltration for uh, cases where uh, the bone is uh, porous enough to, per to allow uh, this form of anesthesia. Uh, for the posterior maxilla, uh, the posterior superior alveolar nerve block or a V2 block, some people recommend if you're doing a sinus lift in order to uh, get the medial aspect uh, of the sinus wall, uh, middle superior, superior alveolar nerve block, and anterior superior alveolar nerve block, and just a greater palatine nerve block. And finally, for the mandible, usually we do the inferior alveolar nerve block along with uh, a lingual nerve block and the uh, long buccal nerve block. Uh, in terms of inferior alve alveolar nerve blocks, we know the percentages of success rates for the standard Halstead block is around 87%, uh, the Akinosi block being 95% and the Gow Gates block being 99%. This is a photograph uh, just demonstrating what the standard Halstead block looks like. In this photograph, we basically demonstrate the Akinosi block, which is a closed mouth injection. And finally, the Gow Gates block from uh, Dr. Gow and Dr. Gates down in Australia. I believe this was 1977. Preoperative medication. So, in terms of preoperative medications, the, the two major ones that we're going to be looking at are antibiotics and anxiolytics. So in terms of antibiotics, uh, you're going to want to premedicate a patient uh, who has a joint replacement. Uh, the guidelines from the uh, orthopedic surgeons usually is uh, 2 grams of uh, cephalexin or 600 milligrams of clindamycin uh, one hour prior to uh, the appointment. Uh, the AHA guidelines for, from the American Heart Association basically is uh, for uh, in procedures in which patients have had uh, uh, some sort of surgical uh, intervention with their heart valves, uh, look up the HA guidelines online. Uh, they changed back in 2007, uh, but generally it's about 2 grams of amoxicillin one hour prior, or 600 milligrams uh, orally of uh, clindamycin. And lastly, you want to give pre-op medication in patients where there's infection in order to ensure that uh, the uh, tissue is not infected that you're placing implants in. Uh, many times for immediate implants, uh, I will put patients on antibiotics prior to taking teeth out in order to place implants. This is a bit of a high risk procedure. Uh, many times we will take teeth out, allow the area to settle down, and then bring the patient back uh, in order to uh, clear up the infection prior to placing the implants. Anxiolytics are also something which can be given preoperatively uh, just to help calm patients' nerves. Uh, common uh, medications are things like uh, uh, triazolam, midazolam, uh, just standard diazepam or, or uh, lorazepam. In terms of perioperative medication, uh, the common ones that we give generally are, are anesthetics or local anesthetics, uh, anxiolytics to help uh, reduce the anxiety of the patient, uh, anti-inflammatories. There are studies out there uh, stating that uh, anti-inflammatories like NSAIDs should not be given in terms of uh, uh, causing problems with bone healing. Uh, I haven't seen any studies uh, done for dental implants. I do know from the orthopedic surgery world that when patients have plates and screws and things like that done, uh, they recommend Tylenol for patients or Tylenol with codeine or oxycodone, and they don't recommend using things like ibuprofen or uh, ketoprofen or any of the uh, more common NSAIDs that we prescribe. Uh, however, uh, these anti-inflammatory medications sometimes can be given to patients. Uh, and lastly, uh, perioperatively, sometimes we will give antibiotics uh, as well to the patient. 
postoperatively, uh, there are some clinicians that don't give antibiotics postoperatively to their patients uh, after doing a implant surgery. I am a clinician who always gives patients antibiotics postoperatively, and the answer question is why. Uh, more or less, you're working in a dirty field. Uh, this isn't like we uh, have an opportunity to basically work in a sterile field where we open a patient up and close them up and everything's hunky dory. Uh, many times when we're doing our osteotomies, and despite the fact that we tell the assistants, uh, our surgical assistants, and the patient, keep your tongue away. I mean, patients always take their tongue and explore the hole that you just created and inoculate that beautiful surgical site with saliva. And, you know, tongues are just sieves for bacteria. So uh, from, from my perspective, I'd much prefer to put a patient on a post-operative medication like an antibiotic. Uh, in order to mitigate any chance there there being a postoperative infection, uh, some clinicians don't do this, uh, but I wouldn't recommend that. Postop analgesics, uh, commonly uh, we give patients Tylenol. Some patients prefer to take things like ibuprofen or ketoprofen. We discussed this previously uh, in terms of uh, orthopedic surgeons not liking use not liking uh, us to use things like um, NSAIDs, as there are studies that would indicate that this uh, affects bone healing. Uh, other types of analgesics that we use, routinely use will be uh, the use of codeine or the use of oxycodone. Uh, Anti-inflammatories we just covered. And finally, decongestion. So whenever you're doing a procedure at or near a patient's sinus, you may want to give them a decongestant in order to ma ma maintain uh, patency of the opening of the sinus uh, as if this was to get congested, they were to get congested and develop a sinusitis, this would not be good uh, had you just you know, completed a, uh, a sinus lift, a sinus bump, or even placed an implant close to the sinus margin. Biomedical engineering. So the question you need to ask yourself here and ask yourself honestly, is this going to work? Are the number of implants required adequate in terms of angulation and vertical orientation? Biomechanical factors need to be considered to avoid overloading the implants and the prosthesis. Despite the fact that some, some sort of design may work intuitively for a short period of time, just because it can work in one particular case doesn't mean it's going to work with everyone. Every patient is different. So we have some patients who are like rabbits. Uh, they eat carrots. Uh, they, eat, uh, they eat leaves, and that's all they eat. Then we have some patients who we don't understand uh, how they eat rocks, but they, they manage to eat rocks and their teeth represent um, a, a very, very uh, aggressive, abrasive diet. So you need to know your patient and you need to ask yourself uh, this question. Is this design going to work or is this something which is going to fail? Because as we mentioned many times now, surprises in implant dentistry are not good and negative outcomes in implant dentistry are never a good thing either. So the next lecture is finalization of the treatment plan and consent law. I've once again included the same references that we've previously referred to. I would encourage you to look these references up as there are some excellent articles in here and that you can learn a lot of information uh, from the, reading these references as well. On behalf of the entire uh, treatment team at Cataraki Woods Dental Implant Institute, I want to thank you for listening to our lecture, and I welcome you to Lecture 5.